as we go. Um, so my name is Wendy Stefan. I'm the health educator and epidemiologist at the Poison Control Center in Miami. Um, and so we're pleased to bring this to you um, in the midst of the pandemic and the other things we're dealing with right now. Um, we're also uh, in hurricane season here in Florida. Uh, so if you're listening from outside Florida, just know that some of the information I'm sharing today is not only specific to hurricane, but in fact is useful for other types of disasters. So including um, even winter blizzards, flooding, um, tornadoes. Um, and so we will be talking a lot about hurricane, but keep it in mind that this, is, um, this information is actually important um, for other types of disasters as well. Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead um, and start with a poll um, just really quickly to sort of see how you'll be sharing this information. Um, this is a presentation that we give for people who intend to share the material with others. Um, so we will be adding some tips about how to share uh, information and what types of um, facts and resources are most helpful for people. Um, so I did want to know sort of where uh, you guys were getting your um, um, let's see, this is the different poll, not this one. Oh, it didn't seem to record. So we'll just do a poll at the end. <laughs> um, so, but the intention really is for you to be able to take this information, share it with others and answer questions about poison control and about how to stay safe after a storm. So I'm gonna go ahead then and start by sharing the screen. All right, screen two. All right. Great. Can everybody see my screen, my presentation? Awesome. Okay, great. So again, my name is Wendy Stefan. I'll be your contact here if you have questions or follow up. My contact uh, email will be at the end. Um, so we do typically see uh, a surge in calls after disasters. Um, certainly that's been the case for the pandemic. Uh, poison control centers have seen a large increase in calls, um, really kind of an unexpected increase, and we're going to touch on that later in the program. Um, but we do typically see increases in calls uh, to poison control centers after a disaster. Disaster. Okay, let's go ahead here. All right, so the my hopes today with our program um, will that be that after you see our talk today, you will ha know exactly how to reach the Poison Control Center and have a good grasp on the services we provide. Um, we're going to talk about a few specific poison hazards that we see both indoors and outdoors um, after disasters. Um, and again, as I mentioned, talk about some techniques for sharing this information with other people. I'm going to touch on some of the printed materials we have available um, and. Uh, uh, and some of the visual displays that we typically use. Um, and then we hope that after you see this program, you'll be able to share this material with others, whether it's your neighbors, family members, community. Um, and then of course we do at the end of the program, want you to save the number into your cell phone so that you can reach poison control uh, quickly and easily. All right, so that's just a little picture there of our poison control center. Um, we are located across the street from the trauma center here at Jackson Memorial Hospital, uh, UM uh, School of Medicine. We are one of 55 poison control centers in the United States. So we have colleagues all around the country doing similar work. And wherever you are in the country, you will be able to access a poison control center via the 1-800-222-1222 number. Um, so our poison center serves the southernmost six counties of Florida. So that is Lee, Collier, Palm Beach County, Broward, Miami, Dade, and Monroe. Uh, so that is my territory. So those are the communities I'm most familiar with. With, and I'll be sharing some data from them about our experience with recent storms. Our center is a little bit unusual around the country in that the people who talk, uh, who actually answer the calls, you see some of our um, staff here in this photo, are actually all physicians, um, and that's somewhat unusual. So around the corner, the people who answer the phones, we call them spies. They are specialists in poison information. Um, all of our spies are actually doctors, um, but around the country, you may be speaking to a doctor, nurse, or pharmacist when you call poison control. Um, so our services are available in English, Spanish, Creole, and other languages via an interpreter. Um, so we do have doctors who speak Spanish and Creole um, uh, routinely, um, and then for those other languages, we would be speaking uh, using an interpretation service. 
All right, so just a little bit more background about the hotline. Um, so if you're not familiar with, from, uh, with poison control, this is the national 1-800 number you see here on the screen. So again, 1-800-222-1222. Um, it is a national service. So again, I have colleagues around the country providing these same services. So if you are traveling, you're on a cruise um, anywhere in the country, this is the same number. So you can, again, save it into your phone and have it accessible. Um, we're always open, so 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, and from a public health perspective, um, I, I know we, we reached out to people in the public health community for this program today. Um, our data is being uploaded, not continuously, but in near real time to the National Poison Data System. Um, so this is very important because it helps us respond, detect, and then respond to emerging public health threats. So we had a number of opportunities to do that recently during the pandemic, um, but we're always there doing that for sort of more general poison related uh, issues. Um, in terms of sharing this information with other people and encouraging them to call, we know that there are three factors that are really important to convey about why to call the Poison Control Center. The first is that you're getting incredibly fast help. Um, so basically on the third ring, you're speaking to a poison specialist, and that poison specialist is the same person that would get a call, say, from an emergency room. Um, so you're receiving that same quality of care and expertise in your home as long as you have a working phone. So you know, after a storm, if your cell phone is charged up, even if you can't travel even on the streets, you could be speaking to a poison specialist about an incident that's occurring in your home or with a neighbor, et cetera. Um, the services are free. That's wonderful. Um, we don't care about insurance coverage. Uh, we don't need a copay. None of those things apply. So this is a service available to everyone. And then finally, the services are confidential. Um, why might that be important? Why is confidentiality um, uh, important for the services we provide? Does anyone want to? Unmute yourself and and let me know. Everybody's shy. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Especially on the confidentiality piece, right? <laughs> uh, no one wants to be busted. But it, for some people, um, you know, when they call, they're calling about something that's either upsetting or embarrassing or frightening. Um, if it involves a child in particular, people can be fearful about reaching out for help. Um, so we really want to reassure everyone, and I hope you can reassure the people you're training, um, is that calls are, in fact, um, uh, confidential. Um, so that's a really important selling point just to let people know we're not allowed, we are HIPAA compliant, so we're not allowed to share information with um, other groups. Okay. All right, so when do you call poison control? So accidental poisonings are typically the most common scenario we hear about. Um, occasionally we'll hear about intentional poisoning as well. So those calls are usually oriented towards situations where um, someone has harmed themselves, actually is going to be the more common scenario. We hear calls about uh, insect bites and stings, snake bites, we do pill identifications. So that's not a poisoning, but that's a situation where someone is about to take a medication, for instance, but they wanna be 100% sure that that yellow pill is in fact their blood pressure medication um, and not an antibiotic or something. So that's another service we provide. We also uh, take calls about food poisoning. Um, that term is actually a, a misnomer. So foodborne illness uh, is usually an infection, but because we refer to it as food poisoning, um, our specialists are trained to answer calls about uh, all foodborne illness as well, which you'll see is important for post-storm uh, issues. All right, so just again to reiterate why people are calling, what, be, what the benefit is, you're getting that free expert advice whenever you call poison control. Um, uh, you're getting fast and 24 hour service. And then really what's amazing and, and what we're very proud of is that more than 80% of the people who call poison control, who believe they've been poisoned, um, 
can actually be safely and effectively treated at home. So essentially this is a triage service that we're providing. So for those of you in the medical field or doing emergency management, you know how important triage is, right? You do not want to be rushing people to the hospital who really don't need to be there, um, particularly when it is difficult to move around, say, post-storm. So 80% of our poisoned callers can actually be safely and effectively treated at home. We're going to ask a bunch of questions, find out what the situation is, and we'll be able to provide the advice for home care. And that's a tremendous uh, benefit uh, in terms of not wasting resources, not having that fear, um, not taking steps that may make a situation worse, right? Um, uh, so for instance, inducing vomiting when there can be uh, harm to that. So all of these um, are the benefits of calling. All right. And then I mentioned you can call with questions too. You don't have to wait to do the, the dangerous thing. You can call us uh, before something weird happens um, and that's helpful as well. All right, so some of the risk factors we see for poisoning year-round um, involve um, medication exposures, medication mistakes, um, medication plus alcohol, right? Um, so vacations or travel, right? So people are disrupted. Their normal routines are disrupted. They have all of the pills that are normally in um, nice childproof uh, bottles are now in a pill minder that maybe is not child safe, for example. Um, you know, and people who have systems for remembering to take their medicine um, while they're traveling or on vacation, that can be disrupted. We see seasonal patterns in poisoning. So for instance, um, you know, in other parts of the country, they might have snake bites just in spring um, or in summer. Um, but we, our seasonal pattern really is mostly our storm, uh, storm related uh, poisonings. And then in general with children, uh, a lack of supervision uh, generally can lead to poisonings. That's pro probably the most common scenario in terms of child poisoning is just that uh, a parent was inattentive, uh, the child got out of the the parents uh, view for a few moments, got into that purse, got into that cabinet, etc. So a natural disaster, um, you know, particularly a hurricane, you can see combines all of these factors. Um, so you see people taking medication and probably if they consume alcohol, we know that people will consume alcohol more after storms. You probably heard about the you know, hurricane parties where people are you know, either hunkering down um, or after a storm when people are stressed and reaching out to alcohol. We're seeing that right now during the pandemic. Um, so increased alcohol consumption, medication consumption, for instance, in the dark, right, without power, um, disruption of normal routines. Um, maybe people are displaced from the home that they were normally in. Maybe they are in a shelter. Maybe they are with another family member. Um, and then lack of supervision. Um, if parents are trying to ad address problems with the home or um, you know, getting supplies, children can be unsupervised. So add to that power outage, right? So suddenly it's dark. <clears throat> That's really problematic in terms of taking medication. Um, and then in some cases, people are actually now exposed to the elements. So for instance, if the envelope of the home, which normally keeps out, you know, all of, you know, our creatures, you know, wind, mosquitoes, all of these things is broken. So essentially, you've got damage to the home where you can um, be exposed to the elements that can increase your risk. Um, and as I mentioned, loss of routine. So these are the factors that come together after a storm to increase those poisonings. Um, you know, all of the sort of elements are there, but they're really brought together by um, hurricane. All right, so here are, uh, I just wanted to mention medication mistakes because uh, even under normal circumstances, our most common type of poisoning now involves medication. Um, and the ones most serious that, or tend to be most serious or potentially fatal are going to be medication mistakes involving medicines for pain. Um, this is because the medications for pain are affecting the nervous system. So they're great maybe for dampening down um, our pain response, but they also control the central nervous system, which controls particularly our breathing. So when people take too much medicine for pain, particularly if that's an opioid uh, medicine, like like a Percocet, uh, oxycodone, hydrocodone, it can suppress breathing, 
So that's really the biggest danger um, in terms of an overdose with pain medicine. Sedatives have a similar effect, right? They're also controlling the central nervous system. And then third, we have stimulants. So drugs that um, can cause a stimulating effect um, can also cause problems with heart rhythm um, and stroke, et cetera. So why are people getting, making these mistakes? Sometimes it's misuse, right? Someone is using a prescription um, in a way that wasn't, um, that wasn't prescribed to them. So using someone else's medicine, using medicine um, for not its intended purpose. Um, maybe they couldn't access their normal medications, so they're using someone else's. Um, child's curiosity, right, back to supervision. Um, if medicine's available in the home or a child feels they know how to use medicine, um, they will do self-service. That's a problem. Back to low lighting. If you can't see well, if you're not able to read the labels, that can put um, people at risk. And then I mentioned the sharing medications. So these are different um, things under normal circumstances um, that lead to poisonings. Um, so you can just see most of us have a lot of medications in our home at any given time. Um, and this is just a, one little sample here you can see. So mixture of over-the-counter medications, supplements, uh, prescription medications, both current and old, are present in the home, typically. All right, household products. Oh, before we get too far, I wanted to show um, something we have to do at, as poison educators is show you <laughs> our pill and candy display. So uh, this is a really important display that we use um, to show parents and grandparents why medicine might be interesting to children, right? They're, why would their blood pressure medicine be of interest? Um, and so we do show this to them and you can actually make this or show images of this as you're sharing information with um, families about post-storm safety. Um, this point is very important. Um, if you have not thought about how similar a Skittle looks to a, uh, to a, for instance, very powerful anti-allergy medicine, or for, for instance, this one here, this is uh, the little green one here, that's an iron tablet. If you haven't thought about that um, and that medicine is available, you c it's very um, easy to see how a child could make a mistake. All right, so that is our pill and candy display. This is something you can make yourself. We do recommend that it is not easy to access because I've had children trying to figure out how to get into it <laughs> at public events. So you do want to make sure that it is secure um, and not available if you share that information. An image is going to be safer. Um, so another thing we see is household products. Um, we saw, for instance, after the, the pandemic, or actually during the pandemic, we are seeing a huge increase in the use of cleaners. We typically see that after storms, right? So if there's been a flood, if there's been damage to the home, um, we will see increased use of, of cleaners, particularly bleach, um, really common. Um, so here's just a few. It can be um, by mouth or inhalation. Um, as people are combining different types of cleaners, um, that is certainly a possibility. And then let me show you just some uh, one of this issue, what we call a look-alike product. Again. <clears throat> so these are two um, cleaners, or actually this is a, one is a cleaner and one is a drink. Um, these are their original containers. So you can see that these products are look-alikes. Um, and so this would, we, we would call this a look-alike poison. Right, so this one, not to pick on Fabuloso, but there are many brands that have similar uh, graphics that are very appealing um, and use a lot of food and fruit imagery. This can be very confusing under normal circumstances, even more so in a situation where there's an emergency or disruption in the home, low lighting, etc. You can see why someone might drink this. Okay, so that's something to be aware of uh, post storm, but really every day we see this as well. Um, and then just in general, uh, there can be confusion about reading uh, product instructions, using these chemicals safely, um, and then we also have uh, container confusion. So just showing this here, if you can see me, this is um, an example we use here in Miami. This came from a real case uh, where someone uh, drank, um, let's see, which one is it? I have to think about it. Uh, antifreeze from a Gatorade bottle. So this is uh, antifreeze. It looks like blue raspberry Gatorade or etc. Um, and so we show this look-alike 
situation when we do our trainings. Um, and you can, again, make one of these displays very easily. Um, do put it in a safe container. You can see that this is a container uh, store Beanie Baby Cube. That's what this is. <laughs> if you want to make a similarly safe one, it is difficult to get into um, so that little hands cannot explore your display. Um, this one is watermelon flavored Gatorade, and that one is the antifreeze. So we may have these products in our home, your neighbors may have these products, and they may, uh, in a storm, if they're available, the lights are low, there's distraction, uh, we see a greater chance of people getting poisoned. Okay, um, carbon monoxide. Uh, this is the number one uh, problem after storms, and it would be similar after, say, a blizzard uh, in Northeast, where people are running generators um, to power, uh, you know, important things in the home. In, in Florida, it could be air conditioning or power. Um, around the country, it might be heaters, etc. Um, so carbon monoxide's chemical symbol is CO, so it's one carbon atom, one oxygen atom, so that's where it gets the CO um, symbol. It is an odorless and colorless gas. Most people know that. Um, the symptoms of carbon monoxide exposure typically are going to be headache, nausea, dizziness, um, in general, but by the time people are symptomatic, that can actually be already in a danger zone where they may have difficulty leaving the area at that time. So um, you don't really want people to wait uh, to experience symptoms um, before leaving an area or exploring like, oh, I wonder where, I wonder why we're not feeling well, etc. You do not want to wait for symptoms. Um, typically, carbon monoxide poisoning um, comes from generators, and, and I have one pictured here. You can see this is a portable gasoline-powered generator. Um, these are the ones associated with, with the vast majority of um, serious and fatal accidents um, with carbon monoxide. Um, people, they're just very easy to use. You can truck them wherever. You can park them wherever. Um, there's not education required when people um, buy them from Home Depot um, or Lowe's. They just bring them straight home, plug them in, fire them up, and we'll see those poisonings very, very quickly. Uh, it doesn't take long if people are using it incorrectly. We also see poisoning from carbon monoxide related to vehicles. Um, so that would be, for instance, a car running in a closed garage. Um, and then also grills, any type of combustion or incomplete combustion will give off carbon monoxide. So we do see grills and fires. So for instance, we had a case here in Miami-Dade. We had a cold snap, which we don't handle really well here. Um, and there were some children that had been left alone, um, including some teenagers, and they started a fire inside an apartment in a tire to warm up. Um, and they were poisoned. Um, so fires inside, that's why we have a fireplace and a flu, um, and also grills operated inside or in an enclosed area. So those are some of the scenarios we'll see post-storm as people lose power. This is just some data from uh, Hurricane Irma um, from Miami-Dade County. Um, specifically, the health department um, did a great um, and, you know, a really great analysis of this. Um, we had about 90% of our residents lose power. It, we were not really directly hit by the storm. Um, so this was actually interesting because we had such serious exposures to carbon monoxide. It was just much worse than the, the injuries and, and illnesses and certainly fatalities um, than we had actually directly related to the storm. Um, so we had about 91 people who um, were reported serious effects. Uh, 79 were put were presented to an emergency department. Seven were hospitalized. Ten required treatment um, to reoxygenate the blood, essentially in a pressurized chamber. And we had three fatalities. Um, so for the people who died. Um, about half of the hemoglobin in their blood was saturated with carbon monoxide. So the blood um, simply couldn't carry oxygen around the body. Even though the blood was circulating, no oxygen was being transported to the cells. So that's how carbon monoxide poisoning works. Um, it is not something that you would visually see. Um, it's something that can happen very slowly as that carboxyhemoglobin level creeps up. The symptoms, as I mentioned, are are pretty vague. Um, so you can see this is an epidemic curve on the slide. Um, so the storm occurred on the 9th. Um, 
oh, sorry, this is 18, not 19. Um, I mean, not uh, not 17. And you can see that the, the exposures happen right away. So this is not something that takes weeks to months to develop. So people using a generator improperly will be, become sick almost immediately. Um, and so you can see that it was really just a few days after the storm where we saw the peak um, of our uh, exposures in Miami-Dade. Okay, um, so what we found was in the third of the cases that um, my, uh, we saw in Miami-Dade, um, the generator was actually being run inside. So that's only a third though, because most people do have a sense that you're not supposed to run it inside. But what was surprising to me with this data was that almost 60% had it outside the home, but simply too close. So this is where our CERT volunteers and neighborhood educators and residents can really help their neighbors, is that you would be able to see this generator, right? If you can hear the generator, they're really loud. Um, and as you're walking around doing your patrol, checking on neighbors, um, you know, assisting, bringing in supplies, et cetera, you can observe where these generators are. Um, so in this case, they found that the average distance for the people who got sick um, and that the ones that had it outside, they had it about eight and a half feet from the house. So that to them seemed like enough space, but clearly it wasn't because they got sick. Um, or some of them, there was a number of people who had it farther away, 14 feet away, but there was an air conditioner that was uh, uh, drawing it in. So actually pulling the, 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 um, the gas toward the house. So in that case, you know, even 10 feet, 14 feet wasn't enough because you had something actively pulling it. So that was really interesting. I had never thought about that dimension before I saw this research. All right. So... 20% of the people who were sickened by this, prod, um, by this um, by carbon monoxide just said that somebody had given them some education on um, um, carbon monoxide safety. So most of the people who got sick really didn't feel that they had uh, received information about safety, okay? And Wendy, so, before we um, move yeah. on from carbon monoxide, uh, sure. Karen had a question about um, mm -hmm. is carbon monoxide specific to a certain type of grill or to all types? It's any type. Thank you for the question. Thanks, Bree. So it's any type of um, incomplete combustion. So in general, we see more carbon monoxide thrown off from, say, charcoal, right? So charcoal grills will throw off more. Wood burning will throw off quite a bit. Gas, a little bit less. But again, anything in an enclosed environment where something is burning is you have the potential for carbon monoxide to build up. So this means that when you're running your grill, you, you want it, you know, in not in an enclosed space. So I've seen people running their grills maybe in a garage, right, after storms. Um, and even that I would say is not safe. You've got three walls, anywhere where you've got three walls. We've even seen cases where there were two walls. So people were like in a carport and they had their grill and there was just a little bit of wind kind of keeping that smoke concentrated in a corner. Um, and so, so yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Anytime there's something burning. So we've seen boat exhaust, vehicle exhaust, even uh, leaf blowers um, that are throwing off that gasoline uh, exhaust. Leaf blowers are the number two after generators. So um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> All right, so how do we stay safe from carbon monoxide? Because this is a tricky gas, right? It's, it's not something you're gonna see. Um, you really need the carbon monoxide detector. And this is something you can do ahead of storms. It can, something we can be doing with our communities right now is emphasizing the importance of carbon monoxide detectors. You can generally get ones that are combined with your usual smoke detector. So this is what a typical smoke detector looks like. The reason I know that this one is not a carbon monoxide and smoke detector is that nowhere here do you see the CO symbol. You really need to look. Um, new homes um, from uh, built after 2015 are required to have combined smoke and CO detectors, but that's not the majority of homes, right? So usually someone has to go and actually install that separately. So we've done that in our home. They are a little bit more expensive, 
The other alternative and the one I prefer actually for most people is to use the carbon monoxide detector that actually plugs into a wall. It's just a plug. Um, I had one for my display and it was so attractive that it was stolen. Um, so, <laughs> so I need to replace that. But that's really easy because this is good for renters particularly um, or people who move frequently. Um, you don't have to think about that. If you have children in the home particularly, you can just put that, plug it into the wall somewhere near the child's bedroom or near the attached garage, which is the other place, you know, from a vehicle that was left running. Um, so for generators, the guidance is keep them outside um, and it's actually 20 feet away from the home. That is the official guidance. Um, I have, we have a flyer here that I will send you if you're interested in, interested. This is our carbon monoxide flyer um, and we do include the 20 foot away from the home recommendation from CDC. Um, so that is a lot of feet. So in Miami, for instance, we are in an urban environment with our lots being 50 to 100 feet. When there's a house and maybe a guest house, you know, there's really like, for instance, my home, it is not a safe place to run a generator. There's nowhere I can position that generator where it is 20 feet from my house and also 20 feet from my neighbor's house. So this is a really complicated problem because they're selling these products without, you know, a lot of education. There is some labeling, to, um, to be fair, but um, in an urban community, it is very possible that many residents cannot operate a generator safely. So this is problematic. Um, we are trying to get more fire departments involved in sort of educating uh, residents, but this has still been a challenge uh, for us. All right, you want it away from the home we mentioned, but also dry. This is the other challenge is this thing is generating electricity. So it is throwing, so if it's rained on, you can have electrical shocks from the generator as well. So to run that generator safely. Basically, you need a small covered area 20 feet from the house. And I have seen people who actually construct this, but that is rare, right? All right, so reading the safety instructions and then we really only want people using it for critical needs. Um, after Hurricane Charlie, many years ago in Florida, uh, there was some research that you know, was kind of funny that, um, that showed that people were running their generator and having exposures uh, so that they could run their children's video games. This was <laughs> before we have everything on our phone. Um, they were running them to entertain their teenagers. Uh, and at that time, the game consoles were plugged in. <laughs> so you really only want to be using these generators for things that are really, really critical. So if you have an older person in the home who needs that air conditioning, that would be a great reason. If somebody needs oxygen, um, obviously they'll, that's an important thing, but you wouldn't want to run it unless you need to because it is throwing off a lot of this toxic gas. All right, so another factor we see after storms is food and water contamination. When the power goes out, for instance, I mean, we have this loss of power, that is a, a big concern. It can get very confusing about what food remains safe and which not. I did want to mention the problem we've seen with people storing water in containers that are not safe. They're not clean, they're not food grade plastic. So if you're going to store water, um, you know, reuse containers for water, you want to make sure that it was already, that container was used for food initially. So it can be a water jug, it can be a milk jug, for instance, but you wouldn't want it to be, say, something that was used for an oil or any non-food product because there can be residue in that container that contaminates your water. Um, the most extreme version of this um, was occurred in India where um, bottles used for pesticide were reused for cooking oil. Um, and uh, multiple school children were killed. Um, I think it was 20 children died as a result of contaminated cooking oil from that organophosphate pesticide. So we do want to reuse and recycle, but this is a situation where you would not want to be using that, particularly as these jugs tend to get warm, right? So they're hot, they're stored in, in areas that will get warm, so a garage, etc. They're sitting for a while and you can get that chemical leaching that can happen. More commonly will be the incomplete cooking, right? So I know after Hurricane Andrew, our neighbors 
took everything out of their freezer and they had like a public barbecue, right? So the street barbecue is a, <laughs> is a very Florida thing. Um, every, you just get rid of all of that meat. You make sure it doesn't spoil. You're sharing with your neighbors. It can be nice. But if you're not completely cooking those meats up to temperature, particularly if you're rushed, um, you can end up with foodborne illness. Okay, so most commonly would be E. coli, um, salmonella, um, there are others. So you see the, my little temperature gauge here on the screen. Um, this is what's known as the danger zone for foodborne illness bacteria. So these bacteria really like to live between 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That is where they will not only live, but happily reproduce. So when food stays in that danger zone for more than two hours, you have the potential for dangerous bacterial growth. If it's 90 degrees outside or more, food can't even stand at that temperature for one hour. That's it. It's just one hour instead of two. So incomplete cooking would mean that you're simply not bringing those burgers up to 160. Um, so you're, it just means that any bacteria that was left in that food is reproducing and has the potential to make someone sick. Food might be improperly stored, right? So if food was, for instance, in an area contaminated by flood water, it needs to be thrown out. Um, a lot of people don't realize any flood water is actually tremendously dirty. Um, with, it picks up all sorts of like animal waste, uh, chemical contamination. Um, and this was true in the Keys, for instance, people thought of it as seawater. But as the floodwaters move through, you know, residential areas, they're picking up sewage and all these things. It is not seawater anymore. Once it's flooding, um, it is by definition contaminated and therefore will contaminate food. Um, if food's spoiled, it's just simply gotten too warm over time. Uh, we do see people trying to, uh, you know, keep food that is no longer safe, um, and that can cause a problem. Um, while adults, uh, typically healthy adults, might be able to eat food that's a little questionable, we know that older adults and infants are at particular risk of these infections. So when they get these sicknesses, they are more likely to have serious illness or even die. This is also true for people with diabetes. So for residents, for family members, loved ones who have diabetes, they also have to be extra careful with food. Um, and that's something a lot of people don't, don't necessarily know. So how do we promote food safety? Um, any high risk foods, so that's going to be meat. Um, uh, so we have a whole list actually here um, from the, uh, this is a really nice little chart from the American Red Cross. On the back, there is a complete chart that will show you. Um, so some foods can be refrozen. Um, but most can't. Um, so some things like butter, for instance, are shelf stable and can be safe at room temperature, which I didn't realize. Um, but a lot of foods need to be discarded um, after uh, four hours at the most. Um, and so that's important to know. We want you to make sure that you're using a food thermometer when you cook. That's how you know that your burger got up to temperature, not by looking. Um, it, I was really surprised when I started using a food thermometer. It can be digital or analog, it doesn't matter, as long as you're using some sort of tool, um, poking something and see if it runs clear or, um, you know, those types of um, sort of tricks are not the same as using a food thermometer. So this is an important tool to have on hand as part of your hurricane kit. Um, cleaning surfaces and hands regularly with sanitizer if you don't have hot water, um, but hot soapy water, it really is the ideal. Of course, we're, we've learned that, you know, here during the pandemic, um, but this is absolutely the case for um, food safety year round. Hand washing, um, the fecal oral method, it sounds terrible and it's disgusting, but that's exactly how a lot of people will get sick, was by handling, not washing the hands after uh, using the restroom, preparing food and then the next person gets sick.
In our community here and in Florida, uh, we have had um, ongoing problems with hepatitis A, which is also foodborne. Um, and so we having a vaccination against hepatitis A is a good strategy for avoiding foodborne illness um, post storms, but also day to day. So I've had my hepatitis A vaccine, my children have because we live here and this problem is endemic in our community. Wendy, I wanted to, yes. Sorry, before you move on to plants, sure. um, Lenice had a question about uh, food safety and if you could talk about whether the bacteria can be cooked out of the food. Oh, okay, great question. Um, so there are, cooking in general will kill the bacteria. Um, so the idea is to cook as quickly as possible. Most food will have some contamination to begin with. That's why you're bringing it up to temperature and that's great. But there are some toxins that are heat stable. Right, so when food is spoiled, um, when food is bad, cooking it will not necessarily fix the problem. So for instance, some marine toxins um, in particular. Um, so ciguatera is one that it doesn't matter if you cook it, that toxin is not affected by heat. Um, scombroid fish poisoning is another. Um, botulism, for instance, you can cook uh, or freeze and it just sits there waiting um, because it's actually, it's not a live thing. It's actually the toxin that was created by the bacteria. So in general, you don't wanna count on, if anything is off, it's gone. You don't wanna to try to cook it to make it better. This is just not consistently safe. So thank you. Great, thanks Brie. <laughs> um, I did wanna mention a number of poisonous plants that are native to Florida or are common to our area, not all of them are native. Um, but you can see a few of them here on this slide. Why are poisonous plants an issue? Well, because when our power goes out in Florida, we by definition are outside a lot more. Um, it's hot, right? So we're opening up the house, the kids are outside, we're outside maybe cleaning, um, trying to get things back in order, and we have more exposure to some of our poisonous plants. Um, the ones pictured here are all dangerous if eaten. Okay, so this is mostly going to be for children, right? You and I probably not running out and eating plants. <laughs> Sometimes adults do, I'm not saying it can't happen, but generally our plant poisonings um, are involve children who are exploratory, nibble on things, and then get a mouthful of something toxic. So these are some of our, our scariest ones. So the rosary pea there, you see that the toxin is called abrin. And it affects the, um, the liver and kidneys. Um, very, it can be very, very serious or fatal. Um, castor bean in the upper right corner, the poison inside that bean pod is actually called ricin. Um, so you may have heard of that in the context of terrorism. Um, that is a very serious poison. It is difficult to access it, to weaponize it, but it's quite easy to eat it and get sick. Um, so you'll see that sometimes with children who are curious and you know, taking plants apart and incorporating plants with their play. Okay, um, Angel's Trumpet down the lower right. Um, that one is um, also um, problematic because it is abusable. So there are people who will use this intentionally to create a tea to have hallucinations. Um, the Toxidrome includes a lot of gastrointestinal um, problems. It sounds pretty unpleasant, but one of the effects is potential hallucinations, particularly uh, visual auras. Um, and so some people will seek it out if a child just nibbles on this plant, though, they're going to get extremely sick. Um, the oleander, the effect we see there is a cardiac effect. So you see changes in heart rhythm. Um, if a child nibbles on it or um, chews on any part of that plant, they'll see uh, potentially dangerous uh, changes to the heart. All right, I wanted to mention mushrooms and molds. Um, of course, this is something we deal with year round. This is certainly not only after a storm, but I wanted to mention of it. Um, we do see more mushrooms after periods, uh, wet periods. So we've been seeing them locally and we've had increases in calls as a result when we get to our rainy season. <coughs> Excuse me. Many of our dangerous mushrooms in Florida are essentially identical to edible species. So we do not, encourage the wild harvest of mushrooms in Florida. Um, it's something that needs to be done with tremendous caution um, and expertise if people do it. You don't hear a lot of uh, wild mushroom harvesting here in Florida. Um, you know, that's more of a, a northern thing where people will do that routinely. 
here you see the psilocybin mushroom pictured. This is one that is also abused uh, for the purposes of hallucination, but can easily be mistaken for another uh, mushroom that is just frankly toxic. Okay. Uh, mushrooms are attractive to children and dogs. Um, we've heard people talk about their dogs um, interested in the mushrooms. Um, and then also mold. So when homes are damaged by um, water, when there's a, that leak in the roof, you see the blue tarps on the roof, um, you can get mold very quickly in the home. Um, and those molds can cause a lot of respiratory irritation, um, upper respiratory irritation, um, you know, pretty much immediately, particularly people who have that sense sensitivity um, or allergies to begin with. Okay, so this is just a petri dish here that you can see this was left out in a home that was flood damaged um, after Hurricane Katrina. Um, so you can see multiple species of mold growing out just from the room air. Um, and that's uh, just because they got, it got a foothold in that wet home. All right, this is uh, poison ivy. So this is one we saw actually a lot after the uh, foreclosure crisis in uh, Florida and the United States where homes were kind of left to um, overgrow. And so this is what our, our um, uh, variation in Florida looks like. You see the glossy leaf um, and the three leaf, um, the tri tripartite leaf. Um, so the dried version is there on the right. Thank you, Bree. This is uh, from your, your, your center. This was such an awesome display. So you can see that has the little flowers in the spring and then actual berries that you see in the photograph um, in the fall. And this is a woody vine um, here in Florida. There are different types, but this is the one we look out for. And that glossy leaf is really the key because the thing that causes the blistering in people is actually the arushiol on the leaf, it's an oil. Um, and so that will brush up against people and about a third of us have a chemical sensitivity. It's actually an allergen to us. We have a sensitivity to us and we're gonna get blisters, terrible blisters. Um, my mother has an allergy to it. She was actually hospitalized as a young woman. So most likely I have that sensitivity too because it does seem to be genetic. Okay, I wanted to mention- Wendy? Yes. Karen um, had a question about okay. where do we, where do they go to get a full list of native poisonous plants? Do we have a place for that? Well, we have um, our website. Um, let me take, uh, show you, I'm just gonna quickly show you our website, which I had here just a minute ago. Where does it go? <laughs> let me see, I'm gonna open this up. So we have a, I can't say it's a full list because obviously with plants, there's just tremendous diversity. So I'm gonna pull this up here. Um, here is our website. All right, so it's floridapoisoncontrol.org. Um, and then we have poisoning in Florida. And here is our little icon. So there's carbon monoxide, medications, some of the things we've already talked about. There's plants. Here's the flyer that is included in the mailer. If you guys want the mailers, uh, I can send that out. The University of Florida has a wonderful um, program. And then we have uh, a list here. And not all of these are native, but these are common plants in Florida. Um, so that is one resource for you. But I would also recommend the University of Florida uh, extension, it has some great information on poisonous plants. Um, all right. All right, gonna go back to this. Oh, we jumped to the wrong thing. <clears throat> All right, back to snakes. <laughs> All right, so here in Florida, we have about 50 species of native snakes, um, but only six are venomous statewide. So as we mentioned, after storms, it's not only people that are displaced, it's also wildlife, right? So if you think of things getting blown around and moved and floods, and everybody gets kind of places where they didn't used to be. Um, so snakes are part of that. Think of those huge debris piles post storms, right? So that's a great place for snakes to live. We also see a lot of rodents post storm because of the, of the garbage and etc. Snakes really do well in that environment. So we definitely see an increase in snakes post storms. So these are the six venomous species um, that are listed here. The one that is in the photo 
is not a venomous snake. This is actually one of our non-venomous species. Um, I just wanted to show you, this is a Florida garter. Um, it is a beautiful snake. Um, non-venomous and you're gonna see how he looks different. So take a good look at his head, the shape of his head, his coloration, and then we're gonna look at the venomous species next. All right, so what you should notice about this snake, here's the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake. He's super different, right, from the one that I just showed you, right? Most notably what? Like in terms of his shape, how is he different from that garter snake? Anyone want to jump in? Karen commented that uh, triangular head. <laughs> okay, right. So he's got this great big head and he's super fat. You see how fat his body is? So when the Miami-Dade County Fire Rescue a Venom 1 unit, they have a special unit for snakes. When they get a call from someone about a snake, the first thing they ask is, it is it a fat snake or a skinny snake? <laughs> because the skinny snakes tend to be non-venomous. That's not all of the time. I'll, I'll show you the exception. But in general, the fat snakes are the problems. Okay, so you can see that all of the snakes in the viper family have this great big head. That's where their venom glands are, are behind their eyes. You can really see them there, right? And they're just a very fat snake. Okay, so that's the one. You see the diamonds on the back. Um, these tend to live in areas where they can have a lot of habitat. So these don't tend to be in neighborhoods because these can get big, six to nine feet. Um, so that would be more northern Florida, um, Everglades, etc. All right, so here's the pygmy rattlesnake. Again, you see the big head, you see the fat body, but this one is really distinctive because you see that broken red or orange line across the back. Okay, that's really distinctive for pygmy. What does pygmy mean? It means small, right? So he is only 18 inches at full power, right? So this is the snake we are seeing more and more bites from in our state because he really doesn't need as much habitat. Um, he can do quite well in an urban environment um, and actually nurseries, are a real favorite of the snake. So some of our recent bites have been people who brought home a plant from a nursery, reached in, and one of these guys was actually curled up in the pot. So this is the one I would expect to hear about after storms, just because they're more likely to be in urban environments to begin with, um, and so, and they're small, uh, easy to miss, okay? Here's the water moccasin or the cottonmouth. This is a very common snake and also one we hear about fairly regularly at poison control. Um, this one is in and out of the water. Okay, so if you're living near a canal, if there's been flooding, if canals have come up, um, this is a snake that could easily be in a, in a new spot if it's near a canal. Um, so distinctive features here, you see the big head, um, you see the fat body, He's going to appear mostly black. These images um, show a little texture, and that's just because it's a flash. Basically, when people describe this snake, they describe a black snake, a big, fat <laughs> black snake, very thick. Okay, and the other distinctive feature is that eye line, that really strong black eye line you see on the right, and you see he has an angry eyebrows. <laughs> That's actually common for all of the, the vipers is they have like this eye ridge that comes down and they really do look a little bad tempered. Um, and that is a feature of the viper. It's not that he's making a face. That's just how he always looks there. Um, so those are the distinctive features. There is a similar snake that is non-venomous called a banded water snake. So we do occasionally get calls, but they don't have that strong feature. And you're going to see more of a banded effect, like a striped effect through the body on that snake. And I've heard the um, water moccasins also be described that I, what you were describing, kind of like a Zorro mask. People have described it like yep. that before. Yep. Or Incredibles that, mask, because my yeah. son has no idea who Zorro is. So. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, Zorro is kind of outdated now. So yeah, Incredibles mask. Um, exactly. So that is one of the features. Um, so, and then here's the exception to the rule, right? So for every rule, there's an exception. So I told you about the fat snake and the big head. Okay, so this is a different native species to Florida. This is the coral snake, and he is not a viper. He's in a different family. He's in the same family as the cobra. And so he has a, that, that slender body shape, right? But thankfully, 
he has his colors. So that makes it easy for us to identify him. He's clearly not a garter snake, even though his shape is similar. So he has the red, black, and yellow stripes and the black nose. Okay, so the black nose is really distinctive. Um, and so, of course, you don't want to get quite this close. This is really close. <laughs> but most of times when people send us pictures of these snakes, you can see the head. And as a result, you can see the black nose. The other feature is, and I'm sure everybody's thinking it right now, red on yellow kills a fellow, right? So the red and the yellow bands are together. It's not just that there are red and yellow anywhere. It's that the red and the yellow bands are touching. So it's red on yellow kills a fellow. Okay, so that's how you can tell the difference. All right. All right, so here's an actual camera phone image from a caller. So this is a classic snake in the bucket picture. We get these all the time. So this is from a caller. So you can see the red and the bands touching red and yellow bands touching and the black nose. So very distinctive, we were able to say right away for this collar, indeed, that is a coral snake and you do need to go to the hospital to receive the antivenom for that bite. Okay. For contrast, I'm showing you the scarlet king snake. Okay, so here, yes, you've got what's a bit yellow and red, but those bands are separated by black. Okay, and again, you notice here on both of them, red nose. Okay, so that's really helpful for you as a neighbor or as a volunteer or as an educator in your community to reassure people that this snake is a harmless snake. And we don't want people just killing snakes right and left um, because actually snakes are good for the environment. Um, uh, they do control rodents, which is that other issue we have after storms. Um, and we don't want people chasing snakes around um, because that's often when they get bitten. Okay, another outdoor hazard during this time is the black widow. Um, again, those are, that is going to be that other creature that is disrupted and as people are handling uh, debris and they're sticking their hands in piles and they're carrying around a lot of stuff, this spider is, is usually, um, has his nest in a, a, a hidden area, like a very secluded area. They build very complex three-dimensional webs. So they tend to like places that are quiet and undisturbed. Needless to say though, after a storm, all bets are off, right? Everything got shuffled around so they can be in that more busy area um, where normally you wouldn't expect a black widow. So you can see the really metallic um, legs and the really large abdomen. What people often get wrong here, I'm just gonna point out to you, the red hourglass marking on this spider is not on the back, it is on the belly. Every, every Halloween decoration in existence gets this wrong. <laughs> so whenever I see that, it's like, oh, even, you know, so if you're looking for that marking you're, and you're looking on the back, you're looking in the wrong place. Okay, so this is one of the spiders that causes a very painful, very, very painful bite. It's more common in central Florida um, and northern Florida for whatever reason. We don't really see all that many bites down here in south Florida. Um, but when I read the case reports on these bites, people are requesting opioids for the pain. I mean, it is tremendous pain. Um, and then you can, if it gets quite serious, you can see other systemic effects, which, um, so it's not just the pain at the site of the bite, you can start seeing full body effects. So it does need treatment. Um, all right, we do get a lot of questions about the brown recluse spider. Um, we do have confirmed bites, but often every little infection, often a MRSA, like a staph infection, is attributed to a brown recluse. Um, this is the actual spider pictured here. You can see the little fiddle marked uh, on the head. So these spiders are not native to Florida, um, but they do come in on our freight and shipped products. So one confirmed bite, Lenny said, I don't know if you remember, we spoke to a legislative aide up in Tallahassee um, and she showed us her scar and she had gotten her bite from a crate of wine. Remember she had had shipped in from California and the spider dropped right out of the crate onto her ankle and she had quite a dangerous bite because it was on a bony area um, that that wound was very difficult to heal. So it's not that the bites can't happen, but it's not, this, this is not a spider who's living in your home. This is not one that's going to be displaced and in that trash pile or debris pile in your yard, um, we wouldn't expect to see that. 
So there is the wound there on the right. Sorry about that. You can see the, the hallmark of it is that black tissue. You actually see tissue necrosis from this toxin. So the wound tends to take up to a year to heal. Um, so I had been told that I had uh, uh, bites from uh, the, uh, brown recluse twice until then I saw this picture and clearly what I had was not um, a brown recluse bite. So this particular wound was on a very fleshy part of the body. It healed fine, but it did take almost a year to heal. This is the native, um, the native location or the habitat of the brown recluse spider. Um, this is a different type of recluse. You can see it includes the wine country in California. So that's the one that hit um, the person that we spoke to. Um, uh, so two different products. So as products are shipped through these areas to Florida, they can pick up these spiders, but we do not see them native to Florida. If you do find um, a, an actual reproducing um, you know, nest of brown recluse, you want to let the uh, Florida Extension uh, know at UF. They're very interested um, to see if that habitat is expanding. But as far as we know now, Florida is not part of its natural habitat. Okay, so there are other irritating critters though that can be in those debris piles um, and that we get calls about on a routine basis, right? So you can see some of them here. This is the saddleback caterpillar. In these spines, there is a neurotoxin. So it's not that the, that the caterpillar bites with teeth, it's that there are these tiny little spines with this neurotoxin that are quite, quite painful. Um, and so you'll get radiating pain from wherever the site of the, the sting is, um, and that is because the nerves are inflamed. So anytime you have, often people don't even see the, the, the caterpillar, but if you have a painful area that will then the pain begins to radiate, probably that is a caterpillar um, and that's that's what also what we expect here in the middle this is the puss caterpillar uh, looks like it should be soft and fuzzy but don't touch it um, <laughs> each one of those spines does in fact have this neurotoxin in it they're very difficult to remove because you can't see them um, and so we walk people through on the hotline how to minimize the pain um, this is the florida bark scorpion um, it when they're tiny, they're kind of golden in color, almost transparent. That's because they're not full size. When they're full size, they have this more dark color. Luckily, these are not fatal. These are not as as venomous as the our our colleagues in um, you know in the desert in um, New Mexico and Arizona. They really have a an ongoing scorpion problem. We really don't have that uh, in Florida um, in terms of a serious uh, cause of uh, injury. All right, fire ants and uh, Africanized honeybees are two of the other um, issues that we see here relating to venomous insects. Um, again, venomous, uh, the, the bee problem can be again in areas that are abandoned, damaged, um, you know, homes that have been damaged by storms, people going back into them. If there is a bee colony in that property, um, the people, anyone who comes in contact is, is at real risk. Okay, so be aware of um, bees. All right, so how do we stay safe from these bites? When you're handling debris or gardening, um, cleaning up, we want people to wear protective clothing. That means closed-toed shoes, long pants, thick pants, which I know is uncomfortable in Florida because it's hot, but important for any type of um, bites and stings, just a little bit of extra protection. Um, eye protection, ideally gloves. When there is a bite or sting, you wanna remove stingers um, uh, and spines. I probably need to treat for infection. This is especially important for um, uh, marine stings as well because there's the possibility that in addition to the venom, you, there may be bacteria also in the wound. Um, you may need to receive antivenom depending on what um, stung you and that is going to be done exclusively in a healthcare setting in a hospital. Um, and we, There are no snake bite kits that we recommend for people to have like at home. Um, you know, that's really beyond, it's they're generally administered intravenously, there's a lot of risks associated with them, so people have to be monitored very closely uh, for allergy and that it's, it's responding um, the way they, you would expect. We do not recommend the use of sucking out the venom, um, cutting. Um, there are a lot of different approaches that we've heard over the years to managing a bite or a sting. Um, but we, there are, what we really encourage is just to, to call the Poison Center and we'll walk you through 
how to handle it. Okay, I did want to mention just some of the things that we're seeing um, during uh, COVID uh, because this is a different type of disaster, um, one that's new to all of us really. Uh, we're learning as we go, um, but since March we have seen a big increase in the use of these particular um, products. So hand sanitizers were the first. Um, uh, sort of overuse, you know, people getting it in the mouth, people getting it into the eyes, um, people making their own, using non um, typical alcohol. So for instance, today in our Facebook post, uh, we're talking about a, a product that was made inappropriately with methanol. Methanol can soak through the skin and cause toxicity. So these are all the things we've been seeing recently. Um, uh, just a lot of people sort of overdoing it with cleaning and chemicals. And some of this we would expect to see after storms. So it's actually a very similar pattern. Um, maybe the vitamins and supplements, not so much because people are trying, are you know, doing some mega dosing and um, with vitamins as a preventive. Um, but most of these other things we do typically see after storms. Okay, um, this came from some very new research that was national, a national survey about how people were responding to COVID. Um, you know, so you see that about 70% of people report cleaning more than normal, but we also saw measurable um, responses, um, you know, to, to, you know, COVID that include dangerous um, exposures to chemicals. So washing products with bleach, um, using household cleaners on their person, um, inhaling vapors like bleach as sort of a preventive or a treatment. So these are all things we have definitely received calls about, um, but it seems to be happening on a national basis. So if people have questions about safely using products, what's effective for COVID, actually they can call the Poison Control Center as well. Okay. All right, so we're there to assist. So as you're sharing information with your um, neighbors and colleagues, you don't have to have all the answers. And I think um, that's really so much about being a resource for your community is you don't have to know it yourself, but you can know who knows. Um, and so for these type of things, we are your resource um, for that. Um, so these are some of the Facebook posts, for instance, that we have done relating to storms. Um, so you can see, uh, you know, we put out a lot of reminders about what you've we've covered today in our program um, so that it's you know directly in mind so feel free to share these posts we also are on Twitter um, so very similar sort of uh, parallel uh, outreach depending on which um, social media you use we're also in the regular media um, as well getting messages out about safety um, but really the key is having access to the hotline. Um, so you'll see it's always, it always appears. So 1-800-222-1222. Um, and that's gonna be uh, linking back to us. So today, if you're interested in getting materials, I did wanna offer, um, normally when we do this program in person, everyone gets one of these um, folders. Um, and inside is the printed material we normally share. So this is about, indoor safety, home safety, opioid safety, and then our outdoor safety pieces. So if you're interested in getting one of these, I'm happy to send it out to you. Um, and what I'll need is just your mailing address and my email is right there. So that's wstefan at med.miami.edu. In the hurricane flyer, I also add, or folder, I add the um, carbon monoxide flyer, which Brie so beautifully designed. Um, as well as material about food safety. This is one that I really love from the USDA um, about all the food safety things we talked about actually in much more detail. So that is also added to this. So if you would like this, I can provide this to you. And again, you see the link um, to our website where we have some of these printed materials um, available, both to you and to your CERT team or the groups that you're working with. All right, so that's my presentation. I'm happy to answer questions. If there are additional questions, Bree, I don't know if anything else came up or if you wanna unmute yourself and hop in. <laughs> no other questions on the chat yet. Okay, awesome. Well, we're there to help. If this is an interesting program and you would like to have a program like this, um, to you know, designed for your group. Feel free to reach out to any of your your local poison center, um, and we are 
up and running now in terms of remote trainings, uh, and we'll tailor it to your group. So if you have a group that's interested in child safety, we can talk about that. Today's program, obviously, about hurricane um, response, but we're very versatile. So um, I do want to, I'm going to stop sharing my screen quickly. Before you jump off, um, I do have a poll that I would like if you um, can. And Wendy, I did, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Karen did ask if this was shareable on Facebook. If the presentation we're not sure. will be, we're going to try. <laughs> this, is, this is kind of our dry run. Um, so that is ideal for us. We would love to provide it that way. We're going to try to figure it out how to do it. Um, uh, but it, it was recorded, as I mentioned. So we'll do our best to get that recording available. But again, reach out um, and we'll do it again for you if that's helpful. I'm going to go ahead and um, launch just a, a quick poll, um, sort of a follow-up. Uh, if you'll just quickly take that before you jump off, I would really appreciate it. It's, we always need um, evaluations and feedback. So go ahead and do that before you hop off. Just copying down your addresses that you gave me in the chat. <laughs> And then Bria, it would be great if we could get the um, opioid, the carbon monoxide up onto the website. That mm -hmm. would be, because I feel, I keep thinking it's there and then I'm realizing it's not there yet. Okay. All right. All right, so I have two of you responded. Give you some more time. Ah, I see you struggling with the milk, the milk question. We didn't cover it actually, so it's not really fair. Um, when I talked about DIY techniques for poisonings, um, that is actually a really common one um, that people, um, believe that you can treat a poisoning with milk, um, and we should have touched on it, so I apologize. Uh, that is one that we do not recommend. Um, sometimes if a poisoning is just irritating, it's soothing, but it is not a true antidote, um, and that's, a lot of people believe it is really basically magic that you give milk and it neutralizes the poison, so that is indeed false. So, thought I had covered it, but didn't. <laughs> And Wendy, it looks like Melissa um, has an address there. In the oh, awesome. Group Thank chat you. If you can see it. I got it. And again, if you want to send me your address privately, that's fine. Just send it to that email. You see it um, there again, wstefan at med.miami.edu. Um, I'm here at the medical school uh, in Miami. And normally we would do these trainings here in our classroom and offer a tour and all these things. So um, we hope to do that again in the future. We have had CERT teams from Miami-Dade here, um, uh, as well as Fort Lauderdale um, and uh, Pembroke Pines and multiple groups. So they really enjoy the tour, but obviously we're in some unusual uh, times right now. So we hope to do that again at some point. Awesome. All right. All right. Well, we got seven out of seven who's, who's responded. Thank you guys so much. We really appreciate you taking the time today um, to share this information, um, to learn uh, from us. And um, we're there to help you uh, and your neighbors if you need us down the road. So let's cross our fingers that we have a very easy hurricane season because we've already got so much going on. Um, but just in case, we will be there every day as usual. Thanks so much, everybody.